Assalamualaikum, salam sejahtera and hello everyone. We are now in the third part of topic 6, the reflected oblique shockwave. Here we have a wedge with a relatively small inclination angle delta 1. With an incoming supersonic flow in region 1 or R1, the wedge will produce an attached shock. The flow that crosses this shock deflects into R2 and aligned with the inclined surface of the wedge. After crossing the shock, the flow decelerates into M2, which is smaller than M1. The flow also compresses into P2, which is bigger than P1. At the top, we have a straight wall, which is the upper boundary that constrains the motion of the flow. As the flow M2 inclines upward, it will later be deflected from the wall, so that it flows parallel to it. If M2 is still supersonic, it will produce the second oblique shock and decelerate into M3, with its pressure compresses into P3. Now, in region 3, if M3 still remains supersonic, it can produce multiple reflections afterward as it flows downstream, being deflected by the surfaces of the wall or the wedge. These deflections will stop when the flow finally decelerates into a subsonic flow. For the first shock, it has a shock angle beta 1 that deflects the flow through an angle delta 1. Please note that both angles are measured relative to the direction of the incoming flow. In the second shock, we have the angles as beta 2 and delta 2. From the geometry of the problem, we can see that delta 2 equals to delta 1. But because the shock angle beta 2 now depends on m2 and delta 2, beta 2 is not the same as beta 1 simply because M1 and M2 are not the same. So, how do we solve these reflected oblique shock problems? We have two separate processes now for the two separate shock waves. We will label this as regions 1 to 2 and regions 2 to 3. In principle, the same procedure can be applied to calculate the changes across these two shocks. There are four key steps in this procedure. To demonstrate, let's apply this procedure on regions 1 to 2. In step 1, we need to use the oblique shock wave chart to find beta 1 with m1 and delta 1 if they are given. Step 2 is to use this beta 1 to find mn1. From this mn1, we use the normal shock table in step 3 to find mn2 and the ratios of all the flow properties. For example, p2 over p1. Finally, with the values that we have, we can find M2, which is the full vector of the flow in R2. As an example, I have set up this problem. The upstream parameters of the flow in R1 are given, as shown in the box here, with M1 equals to 3, P1 equals to 100 kPa, and delta 1 equals to 15 degrees. As a practice, why don't you apply the procedures yourselves and compare the answers that you got with the answers here? For the first shock, the answers are as shown in this box, where M2 reduces into 2.25 and P2 almost tripled to 282 kPa. When we use these new values for the second shock, with delta 2 remains the same as delta 1, we will get the answer for the parameters in R3 as shown in this box here. M3 now reduces to 1.67 and P3 increases by more than twice to 654 kPa. If there is a third or fourth oblique shock that continues from this flow, we can simply continue the same process of calculations to calculate the flow properties in the downstream regions R4, R5, R6 and so on until finally the flow becomes subsonic and the reflections stop. The good news is, there are actually a number of software, computer programs or codes that have been developed to handle these calculations automatically. Many of these programs are available for free online. I would suggest that you use these programs to help you solve problems in this topic. One good example is the one developed by NASA and another by Virginia Tech Aerospace Engineering Department. You can easily google about them to find out more. In some cases, the wall is not straight but inclined at some angle. Let's label this angle delta W. 
Because of this inclined wall, the flow M3 will be deflected with a larger angle of delta 2. Now, the increase in delta 2 will lead to an increase in beta 2. If delta W is negative, then the changes in delta 2 and beta 2 will be reversed as well. Once we have figured out the new delta 2 and beta 2, the rest of our calculation procedure remains the same. Now, when a supersonic flow M1 crosses an oblique shock, it decelerates into M2. Then, as M2 is deflected from the top wall, it decelerates further into M3. Each time the supersonic flow decelerates into a slower supersonic flow, its maximum angle of deflection, or delta max, becomes smaller as well. The problem is, when M2 crosses the second oblique shock, what if its delta max is smaller than its deflection angle delta 2? If that's the case, the oblique shock won't be attached any longer to the top surface. Instead, a strong curved shock will occur in its place. Across this strong shock, the flow will decelerate instantaneously into a subsonic flow. Unlike a supersonic flow, a subsonic flow can easily change its velocity and its direction to realign with the bounding wall without having to cross any oblique shock to change its flow direction. Slightly below that subsonic region, we have a barrier that separates the subsonic flow with another flow below it. This barrier is called a slip line. The flow below it, labeled as M3, can still be supersonic after crossing through an oblique shock that separates between regions 2 and 3. If you look at the slip line, you will notice that it is slightly inclined towards the wall. That, in effect, reduces the deflection angle of the flow such that its new delta 2 is lower than its delta max. This allows the second shock to be attached to the first shock, right below the curved shock near the wall. So, what is a slip line? It is a line that separates between two regions of flows, labeled as A and B in our diagram here. There are three key rules that apply to the flows across the slip line. First, both flows maintain their flow directions. If we define theta as the angle between the flow and a fixed reference line, then theta A equals to theta B. Second, the static pressures in both flows are the same. If not, then the flow in A can push the slip line towards B. If the pressure in A is bigger than the pressure in B, or vice versa. This makes the slip line unstable. A slip line can only be stabilized if PA equals to PB. The third rule is, the velocity across the slip lines are not the same, hence the name slip line, where the faster flow in one region slips ahead of the slower flow in the other region. So, VA is not equal to VB. We are now at the end of this session. To make it easier for us to visualize, let's look at a simulation of a supersonic flow going across an obstacle. We'll see how curved and oblique shocks are produced, how detached shocks occur near the walls, and how slip lines are formed following these detached shocks. As we run this simulation, we can see that the supersonic flow produces a detached curved shock at the front of the square block. This shock later reflects off the upper wall, creating an oblique shock that later reflects from the lower wall. At the top, as the flow deflection angle gets bigger, the reflected shock changes into a detached shock. You can see the slip line downstream of that strong shock as shown here. The wavy line on the slip line indicates that the flow is subsonic in that region. Let's play this video again for you to see it more carefully. As you can see, there are some features of the flows in the simulation that are more complex than what we've learned. We will look at some of these features in our next session. For example, the oblique shock interactions. The rest of the other features are beyond our scope in this topic. Most of these complex features are normally covered in advanced postgraduate or CFD courses. 
Finally, because this is a numerical simulation, some of the flow features might be artificial and appear unrealistic. In such cases, these features don't actually occur in real flows. These artificial flows can be eliminated or improved by upgrading the numerical schemes used to simulate the flows. But we won't go into that for our class. So, this is the end of this session. Until then, bye!